There we go. All right, cool. Hey, grab your Bible or your phone or whatever you do to look at the Scripture. Um, two places we're going to be. First, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, and then after that, we're going to jump over to the book of Jude in verse 4. But there's one thing I need to tell you uh, this morning before we, we go. Just kind of a heads up um, to our parents who are here. If you bring young children into uh, church with you, you, you might want to consider taking them to Kids Life next week. Um, I, I'm going to be tactful, and it's going to be with grace and you know respect, but uh, the topic next week is an adult topic. Uh, so if that makes it interesting, then you come on back next week, and we'll talk about that. Um, but just to let you know that if you got young kids with you, you will be answering questions that you might not want to answer when you leave next week. So I will remind you next Sunday, um, but just, just as a heads up, next Sunday, you got kids, uh, you might want to take them to kids' life with, with Miss Rachel. All right, uh, Matthew chapter 5. So there are some things, there, there are things that God says in Scripture that, you know, when you think about them, I mean, realistically, you're like, what, what, what is he doing? I, I just take a step back and I think, like, why, why do you say this? What, what is it that you're trying to get at here? And why would you ask me to do this? And then why would you ask us as, as a church to to do the things that you, you ask of us. Because what I'm going to read to you in Matthew chapter 5, basically it comes down to this. Jesus is asking you to allow other people to take advantage of you. Now, you got to use common sense. Okay, I'm not talking about people harming you or hurting you or taking your very last dime and leaving you homeless and penniless. There, there's, you got to use some common sense here, okay? But really what Jesus is asking you to do is to allow people along the way to take advantage of you. Now, now, if you've ever been taken advantage of by people, that just kind of hits us wrong because we don't like that. But just with that in mind, just listen to some of the things that, that Jesus says. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. He says, you've heard, so he's talking to some people, he's, he's preaching to them. You have heard that the law says the punishment must match injury. So an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So Jesus, and neither is God, saying you, you have to take revenge. He's not justifying revenge. What he's doing is actually is he's limiting retaliation. So usually if somebody like punches you, you want to kill them. I mean, it's just human nature to want to get somebody back worse than you got got. And, and so what, he's, what Moses is doing when he wrote that back in the Old Testament, he's saying, listen, if somebody puts out your eye, all you can do is take out their eye. If somebody knocks out your tooth, all you can do is take out their tooth. I mean, you, you, he's limiting vengeance. But what Jesus does on the Sermon on the Mount is, is he takes what people have learned and what they have heard and then he moves it to a different place that they would have never considered before because eye for eye, tooth for tooth, you're not going to take advantage of me because if you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you and I, I can only hurt you as much as you hurt me, but I'm going to get back at you. And so there's no taking advantage of anything with that, with that initial law, but then Jesus takes it a step further and, and, and here's what he says, but I say to you, don't even resist an evil person. If somebody slaps you on the right cheek, give them your other. Also, if you're sued in court, and wrongfully is the implication here, if you're sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give them your coat as well. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile because Jerusalem was occupied by the Roman soldiers and the Roman army, if, and they could force you to carry their stuff for a mile, that was a law that was on the books. He says, if they force you to carry a mile, then I want you, I want you to carry it two miles. I want you to let them take advantage of you. Give to those who ask. Don't turn away from those who want to borrow. You've heard that the law says love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say love your enemies and pray for those people who persecute you. So every single one of those, Jesus is basically saying, I want you to allow somebody else to take advantage of you. Now we'll, we'll talk about the whys and everything else in a minute. Over in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there, there's another issue. There was lawsuits in the church, and, and it was driving Paul crazy. Paul was like, this, it, it just shouldn't even be. I mean, you guys should get along. But there were people who were at odds with each other. They were taking their lawsuits before secular judges outside the church. Paul said, man, if you've got a problem with another believer, at least you ought, you ought to bring it to the church. If we can't handle that, man, I don't. it's just wrong. I mean, so don't do that. He, and then he goes a step further, and, and here's what he says. Even to have such lawsuits with one another is a defeat for you. Why not just accept? Why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that? Why not let yourselves be cheated? Now, that's tough, man. I mean, why not just allow yourself 
to, to be cheated. So we're, Jesus is telling us and trying to get across to us is, is if somebody slaps you on the right, give them to your other cheek. If they take your coat, your shirt, give them your coat as well. If they make you go one mile with them, go two miles with you. Allow people at times, and again within boundaries, to take advantage of you. But why? I mean, why would God do that? So there's really two, two angles that we need to talk about people taking advantage of us. The first angle is this, is, is that people sometimes take advantage of me, sometimes they take advantage of you, and you don't know it and I don't know it. I mean, just because we're naive or maybe we didn't see it coming or we didn't really understand the character of the nature of the person that we were dealing with, and they do it and we feel hurt because we were lied to and we were deceived by somebody else, and I mean, it does nothing else but make us angry. I mean, angry, okay? So that's one angle, like you didn't know it was coming, and it came, and it happened, and you're mad, and you're hurt by it. The other angle about being taken advantage of by somebody, and, and hopefully as you get older, you're better at this, but, but here's what happens, is you know it's coming. You, you know her, you know him, you, you see their character, you know exactly what they're going to do, and you allow them to do it. That's what Jesus is really is getting at in Matthew chapter 5, is, is that you see it coming, you know exactly what's going to happen, and I want you at times along the way, I want you to do that anyway. I want you to allow other people to take advantage of you. So why would God ask you to do that? Well, I think the answer to that question lies in the character of God and who God is. Because if you listen to what Jesus says immediately after these, these passages in Matthew chapter 5, listen to what he says. He says, in that way, if you'll do these things in that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven because he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust alike. And if you love only those who love you, what reward are you going to get? I mean, even the corrupt tax collectors do that much. And if you are kind only to your friends, how are you any different from anyone else? Even pagans do that, but you're to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so what we find are there's really two reasons why God would ask you to allow somebody else to take advantage of you. Number one is this, is, is that it makes you kind of like God, right? Because, God, I mean, nobody's going to take advantage of God and God not know about it. Right, So, I mean, he allows that to happen along the way because we had, there's none of us in here who have received you know, the, the consequences for every single thing we have done. So we have all, we've all exploited the grace of God. We've all taken advantage of God somehow, some way or another. But, and God's been still being good to us. I mean, he didn't strike us with lightning bolts. We're all still breathing in here today. We all still have food to go home, you know, to in our houses and cars probably to get in and get there. So God's still been good to you, even though you haven't always been good to him. And so it, it, it is a reflection, an example of the character of God. So we are like him when we allow, and again, with boundaries, people to, to take advantage of us. Secondly, and I think this is the bigger issue, is, is that there is a greater good there's a greater good behind us allowing others to take advantage of us. Because, okay, so why would God send rain on the just and the unjust? Why would he allow the sunlight to bless everybody, the good and the evil? I mean, the reason God does that is because there's a greater good. He wants them to see how much he loves them even though they don't always live the way that they should. Why would you, why, why would you allow maybe a husband or a wife or child, maybe even a friend, why would you allow them to take advantage of you? Well, hopefully there's a, there's a greater good behind it. You're thinking, well, if they see my kindness then maybe they'll, consider, maybe they'll consider Jesus. I think that's really what was behind Jesus saying, hey, you know, if they slap you, turn to the, you know, the other cheek to them. If they take your shirt, give them your coat. They say, hey, go a mile, then go two miles with them. Pray for your enemies. Love those people who, who hate you. I mean, I think the reason why Jesus asks you to do all those things is because there is a greater good behind it. And the greater good is that when they see you, and they experience this relationship with you, they're going to recognize you as a true child of God. That you really do live your life different than everybody. Because listen, and this is the point that Jesus made. The, the tax collectors, they love people who love them. 
I mean, the pagans, they do good to people who do good to them. I mean, that's no different than anybody else. So the only thing that can set the people apart uh, of God apart from everybody else in the world is, is that we do things just a little bit differently and that we might even allow an injustice to be done to us that we might show to somebody else that, guess what? God is great and God is good. And his grace is an incredible thing. And that is the word that the scripture uses to, to tell us and to explain to us why God does this. It is the grace of God. Now, it's a little bit different than the mercy of God. Really, it kind of it's an extension of his mercy. If you, if you show mercy on somebody, that means you just don't punish them. Whatever they did, there's no, you just kind of withhold the consequences of their bad behavior. And God does that for us. He is, he is merciful to us. But grace goes a step beyond mercy. And it says, listen, you did what was wrong. And I'm going to withhold the punishment or the consequences that were due to you. But man, now, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bless you on top of it. I'm going to add goodness on top of the mercy. Even though you deserve something so much different than that, I'm actually going to give you a blessing when you didn't deserve it at all. And so God's grace comes into play with us. Now, the trouble with grace, and the trouble with grace in our relationships with one another or maybe in our marriages is is that sometimes people take advantage of that, don't they? Like you've been graceful, you knew you were doing it, that you weren't naive, you did it intentionally for greater good because you wanted to help a relationship out or somebody else out, maybe see Jesus in you, and they just over and over and over and over again, they're just taking advantage of the grace. And, and people do that with God as well. They think, oh, well, God loves me. And God, God's going to forgive me. And, and God's, you know, in the past when I sinned, he loved me and he forgave me. Nothing bad really happened. So I'm just going to keep doing what it was that I've been doing and expect that there's going to be no consequences of that at all. And so sometimes, sometimes people exploit, they take advantage of the grace of God. And that's what was happening in Jude chapter 4 or verse 4. And that's what Jude is writing and saying, listen, guys, you don't understand what you're doing. You better be very, very careful with this. So, so let's read this together. Verses 3 and 4 in Jude. Dear friends, I have been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation that we share, but now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jude wanted to write about, hey, let's talk about Jesus and about salvation and about faith in him and about the Spirit of God coming to live inside of us. That's what he wanted to write about, but he said, I can't do it because of what's going on in the church. And there's some people, he said, they've kind of wormed their way into the church. And not only are they living an immoral life and saying God's okay with it, But they're teaching other people. They're saying, hey, it's all right, man. Just sleep with whoever you want. If y'all in love, it's all right. It doesn't matter. Cheat, doesn't matter. You just go, you go do whatever you want to do sexually, and God loves you, and he's going to forgive you, and you can live any way that you please without any consequences. And Jude says, whoa, hold on, man. I mean, that is not the purpose of God's grace. That is not why God gives grace to us. That that you are exploiting, you're taking advantage of it, and you are in danger of judgment. So let's just talk about for a minute about the purpose of God's grace. I mean, like, why does he extend grace to us? Number one is this, is is that grace is a key to your salvation. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, is that God saved you by his grace. That means that I didn't deserve it, you didn't deserve it, but when you have believed, when you've placed your faith in Christ, then he saves you by his grace. So it's not just mercy, it's not just, hey, everything's going to be all right, but it's going to be all right, and I'm going to bless you with the Spirit of God living inside of you. And he says, and you can't take credit for that. It's a gift. It's a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done so that no, none of us can boast about it. And so grace is key to our salvation. Number two is this, purpose for grace. This is it keeps us from being crippled by guilt. 
Now, the, you, your personality kind of really plays a role in this one here. There are some of us in this room that are more kind of given to feeling guilty. I don't know why you just have a guilty conscience. We talk about, and then there are other people in the room who are like, man, you got to work at feeling guilty. But, but for those among us who may be a little bit more sensitive when you do something that's wrong, you just beat yourself up. And you just almost feel just crushed by, man, I shouldn't have said it, and I shouldn't have done it, and I am so sorry, God. And you, you just feel like there's this weight that's always on top of you. It's grace that keeps you from being crippled by that guilt. David felt this way a lot of different times. And in Psalms 32, here's what he said. He says, when I refused to confess my sin, my body, physically, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. So you guys know that, that when we do things that are wrong and it kind, of, it kind of goes against our conscience, how do we feel? I mean, there, there are times like literally we feel sick to our stomach. We're like, I wish I hadn't said it. We just feel horrible. And so when we sin... And we hide our guilt and we don't confess that to God. Not only does it affect us spiritually, but it affects us emotionally and it affects us physically as well. But then listen to what happens when he confesses his sin. He said, finally, I confessed my sin to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. And I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me and all my guilt is gone. That's God's grace. That's God's grace. It's not just, hey, you're forgiven, but now I feel a whole lot better than I did before because God's grace is on me. He showers me with blessing even when I don't deserve it. And so it, it keeps us from being crippled by guilt. Third thing is this, is it helps us move past that point of sin because he, here's the rest of what David said in Psalm 32. He says, therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment, for you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. And so you have this guy that one moment was feeling like, Lord, I just, I can't even stand up. I mean, I am weary and I am exhausted and all my strength feels like it's been evaporated from my body. Lord, it's just horrible. I've hidden my guilt from you. But then when he confesses his guilt, God forgives him of his sin. And now all of a sudden, listen to what he's saying. You've surrounded me with songs of victory. I mean, it's like all of a sudden the joy of his salvation has been restored to him. Listen, I talk to believers sometimes. And they tell me, they say, I, I just, I feel horrible. I just, I don't feel the joy of my salvation anymore. And usually what the reason is, is, is that there is guilt in your life that you are trying to hide from God, that you have refused to confess because as soon as you confess it, then there's some level of accountability that you got to change it. But you're not going to receive the joy of your salvation back. You're not going to feel like there's songs of victory surrounding you until you just cast yourself upon the grace of God and confess your sin and turn away from that. And God's grace pours into your life to help you move past those points of sin. Here's another one about grace. It helps and strengthen us just to manage life. Sometimes life gets tough, right? It's not always easy. Sometimes it's very difficult on us. Paul had a hard time in his life. In 2 Corinthians, he just kind of journaled about it a little bit. He said, three different times I asked the Lord, I begged him to take away this thorn in my flesh. And every time God said, my grace is all that you need. My power actually works best in weakness, so now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, the hardships, the persecutions, and the troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so there are days where all of us were just like, God, I just don't know if I can make it. I don't, I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to do my work. I don't want to see anybody. I don't have a conversation with anybody. Lord, I'm sick physically. God, I'm just emotionally, I'm just drained. It just feels like the joy of my salvation is gone. It's like, God, how am I going to get through this? And it is the grace of God that is available to us to help move us through all these things. His grace, His grace is good. And it is a gift that He gives to us because He loves you. In James chapter 1, verse 17, it says, whatever is good, that means whatever is good in this world, whatever is perfect, it is a gift 
of God coming down from our Father who created all the lights in heaven. And so every single thing that you experience in life that is good is from your Father who is in heaven. God wants to give his good to us and his grace upon us. But here's what happens and what was going on in the church is, is that Satan takes the grace of God and he spins it so that it becomes something that's wrong, something that we abuse, something that we, that we just ignore and, and misuse in our relationship with the Lord. The devil tells us, listen, man, you go ahead and do it because it's not going to matter. He says, listen, nobody's going to find out. There's not going to be any consequences to this. There's not going to be any bad effects in your life. Listen, God loves you, and he forgives you, and so you can go do and live any way that you please. But let me, let me just say this. That's wrong. And it's twisting one of those good gifts that God gives to us. And so when, because this is important for us, when and where and how and what are the circumstances where God moves from grace into judgment, where he said, okay, I've done grace long enough, but you've not responded to it, and so now we're going to move over here to judgment. If you look back over to verse 4, it'll give you some insight to it. He says, I say this because you've got ungodly people who have wormed their way into your church. They've said that God's marvelous grace allows you to go live any way that you want, sexual and moral lives. He said, the condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. And so we know, we know when we have moved and we're close to moving from grace into judgment, when we know what is right and we do what is wrong and we do that repeatedly. And we do that repeatedly to the point where our consciences become seared and we no longer feel bad about what we used to feel bad about. You ever had that happen to you before? Like, man, you, you did it and you were convicted. You're like, God, I'm sorry, I'm never going to do it again. And, and, and then you did it again and you're like, hey, God, I'm really sorry. We're going to try not to do that again. And you do it again and you're like, yeah, we're just going to move on. And, and that's how we do as people. And so when we get to a point where there's no more conscience, where we're not feeling any remorse, the guilt's not there any longer, then you're real close to moving from God's grace into, into his, his judgment. The purpose of God's grace is to turn you toward him. The purpose of his grace is to get your attention through his kindness and his goodness and his blessing. Listen to Romans chapter 2. He says, don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin. And so there is a point in time in my life and a point in time in your life that God works and he is kind and he is good and he extends grace to us in order to turn us to himself. But there is also a point where you cross the line and God says, no more grace, now judgment. It's that true and it's that way in every relationship that we experience with one another. You know, in a, in a husband and wife, if you're married, there's always grace between a husband and a wife. Because there, there's not a wife that's perfect, and, and husbands, you've got to show some grace along the way. And, and, and there's, not, there's not a husband that's perfect. Wives, you've got to show some grace along the way. But, but here's the thing. If the husband or the wife just is like, hey, I don't care. You know, I, you're going to love me regardless of what I do. You're always going to forgive me regardless of what I do. And they just blow off your grace. And eventually that man or that woman is going to say, hey, time out. This is not what grace is for. This is not what forgiveness is for. It's not a permission. It's not a license. It's not giving you leeway to go do whatever it is that you please to do in disregard of the relationship that you have with me. That's not how grace works. And the same thing is true about God. As long as God sees us working and sees us moving toward him, there's grace and there's effort and there's love and there's forgiveness. But as soon as you begin to exploit the grace of God, as soon as you begin to use it as a permission to go and do whatever you want, God says, time out. We're not, we're not doing this. Because grace no longer becomes the greater good. Grace no longer becomes the one thing that's going to turn you back toward him. Then the only recourse is that judgment has to be executed in order to get your attention and hopefully save you and redirect the path of your life back to him. Because here's the rest of Romans, okay? You've got you to read everything in context. He says, but because of your stubborn 
and refusal to turn from your sin. You are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed and he will judge everyone according to what he has done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth and instead live lives of, of wickedness. And so if God's grace doesn't turn you, then God turns the judgment and he turns the discipline in order to try and turn you back toward him. And unfortunately, there's some people who ignore even that. I mean, we've got friends and people that we've known. We think, well, that's probably rock bottom. And then it wasn't. <laughs> and then you're like, well, the next time they're in trouble again, you think, well, that, that must be rock bottom. And you're like, nope, that wasn't rock bottom either. You know, and so, I mean, we have this, we have this innate ability in us to just, just ignore God and reject him and live our lives the way, any way that we please. And there, there are consequences to that. So as we leave today, I'm going to ask you a question. Which way are you leaning? Which way do you lean? You know, some of us are leaning over here to like, man, God's grace, it's forgiveness, he loves me, and I'm going to kind of go do whatever I want to do, and I'm going to pretend like I'm really not running from God, I'm really not rebelling against God, but that's what you're leaning towards, exploiting and taking advantage of God's grace. I'd be very, very careful if I were you. Because one day that grace is going to turn to judgment, and I don't know exactly when that happens, but it won't be good for you. Or others of us are going to be leaning the other direction where, where God's grace, you, you're just like, Lord, man, you bless me, I am going to pay attention. I am going to pay attention. You do good to me, you have my full attention. I want to hear everything you've got to say because I don't want to take advantage of your grace. I don't want to exploit your grace. I don't want to live life um, without your grace. And so I'm going to be real careful to stay right here. This, this is where you need to, this is the sweet spot. This is where you need to be. I don't know if you're there, I don't know if you're here, I don't know where you are, somewhere in between, but, but this is where you've got to aim, this has got to be your goal, this kind of, this kind of the end goal for you is, is to, to lean into his grace, be responsive to his grace, and allow his goodness and his kindness and his tolerance to be the thing that turns you so that you don't have to experience, live through the judgment or the discipline of God. Let me pray for us.